Professor Fahad Saleh from Wake Forest University, where he is Nanankam Sineli Faculty Fellow. His research focuses on economic questions associated with blockchain and has been published in leading academic journals such as Management Science and the Review of Financial Studies. Additionally, his research has received several awards, including one from one grant from IBM Blockchain and the Western Finance Association Cubist Systematic Strategies. He holds a PhD from New York University and also holds undergraduate and graduate degrees in operational research from Columbia University and Cornell University. We are very grateful that he has taken time to share his ideas about the scalability of blockchain. But thank you and floor is yours. First, uh, I wanna thank the organizers for inviting me to present uh, at this uh, great event. Uh, it's an honor to be included on the program alongside uh, these other speakers. Uh, in fact, I have to admit that I'm actually relieved to be presenting first uh, because then I don't have to face the, uh, the tall task of following any of the other speakers. Uh, but irrespective of that, uh, I do think it's actually quite appropriate that I'm presenting directly before uh, Cam Harvey's keynote on uh, decentralized finance or uh, DeFi, if you prefer. Uh, I say that because I see the topic for my presentation today is not DeFi itself, uh, but something uh, that could be thought of as the elephant in the uh, DeFi room. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, there's a lot of cool DeFi applications currently deployed on blockchains, but despite how cool those applications are, there's limited usage of them in practice. And as it turns out, the reason those applications aren't so widely used uh, is that there is an economic deterrent in place. And what is that economic deterrent? Well, to paraphrase uh, the title of the editorial that I have included on the slide, uh, the transaction fees involved in engaging with DeFi applications are ridiculously high to the point of being prohibited. So quoting directly from the editorial, uh, it reads, the blockchain is pretty much unusable for average size transactions. Uh, moreover, quote, unless you're willing to pay 100 to 200 bucks, you can forget about a complex smart contract interaction. It's a financial nightmare. So the message here is that while there's a lot of opportunity due to decentralized finance, it's nonetheless important to realize that there's some work that needs to be done to enable uh, DeFi to not only survive, but thrive. As cool as DeFi applications themselves might be, it turns out that there are important issues with the underlying blockchains on which these DeFi applications operate. Those important issues in turn make the cost of interacting with DeFi applications prohibitive, and that is the elephant in the DeFi room, because it is necessary to address the issues with the underlying blockchains for DeFi to actually succeed. Now, I don't mean to frame the concern that I just raised uh, as a novel point, because it's not. In fact, if you ask practitioners, there's an obvious solution. Specifically, we need to scale uh, blockchains. And what does it mean to scale blockchains? Well, it just means to increase the rate at which activity is posted uh, to these blockchains. Put another way, uh, scaling a blockchain just means increasing the transaction rate uh, of that blockchain. Now, the conventional wisdom around scaling uh, is that it will resolve the issue that I raised on the previous slide, and it will do so without any qualification. The intuition for this conventional wisdom is that increasing the transaction rate of a blockchain would relieve the congestion in the system and thereby bring down fees. The lower fees in turn would remove the economic deterrent to adoption and thereby enable DeFi to achieve a widespread adoption. However, the key point I wanna convey in this presentation today is that this conventional wisdom uh, that I just outlined is actually not correct. 
In particular, as I'll explain, scaling a blockchain does not enhance adoption in general. Rather, the intuition that I lay out on the top half of this slide turns out to overlook the economic implications of key aspects of the institutional setting for prominent blockchains. As a consequence, the conventional wisdom wrongly concludes that scaling always enhances adoption. In fact, the research that I'm going to share with you uh, today establishes that whether scaling enhances adoption actually depends upon a key aspect of the institutional setting. Now, what is that aspect? Well, the effects of scaling the blockchain will depend upon what's called the consensus protocol, it turns out. Scaling the blockchain. The effects of scaling the blockchain um, will depend upon what's called the consensus protocol, it turns out. Um, and, and so what are the consensus protocols that, that we're looking at in this work? Well, we're basically looking at the two uh, most used, most prominent by any measure, in fact, uh, consensus protocols um, for blockchain. So one of them is called uh, proof of work, which I'm going to abbreviate with POW. The other one is called proof of stake, which I'll abbreviate with POS. Just to give some context on this, Bitcoin uses proof of work. Um, Ethereum, which is the platform that supports most of the decentralized finance activity right now, also uses proof of work. Um, however, most of the more recent blockchains that have been launched use proof of stake. Um, so Cardano, for example, uses proof of stake, and it is the uh, third uh, largest blockchain by market value of its uh, native asset behind Bitcoin and Ethereum. Also noteworthy here, Ethereum um, has for a while been claiming it's going to transition to proof of stake and now has a test uh, chain that actually does use proof of stake. So these, so, so the, the selection of these protocols are really just because they're the far and away the two most prominent ones. Um, and the key findings, when you actually look at the economics implied by the institutional setting implied by the particular protocols, um, is that proof of work and proof of stake actually go in exactly opposite directions in terms of the implications of scaling upon uh, adoption. Um, and so what more precisely is that? Well, um, for proof of work, basically scaling can actually undermine adoption. Um, whereas for proof of stake, scaling does, as you might expect, enhance uh, adoption. But by the way, it's not actually the intuition that I described on the previous slide because it, it actually has an amplification mechanism by which adoption goes up by more than you would expect um, because of the specific institutional setting. So again, the conventional wisdom is, is not true and it's importantly not true in the sense that depending on the protocol, it can even go in the exact opposite direction. Um, and this is particularly kind of noteworthy for Ethereum because Ethereum currently uses proof of work, which our work shows doesn't actually do all that well um, in, terms of, in terms of its adoption levels when you scale it. Um, but Ethereum wants to transition to proof of stake, which actually um, should allow for uh, widespread usage of, for example, DeFi applications uh, once it is uh, scaled. So the, the way I've laid out this presentation is that I wanna actually dig into each of these results and provide at a high level um, an understanding of why they actually hold. Why is it that for a proof of work blockchain like Bitcoin or Ethereum currently that scaling might undermine adoption? And why is it that that doesn't hold true for a proof of stake blockchain? Um, of course, this requires uh, clarifying, you know, what is a proof of work blockchain and what is a proof of stake blockchain? What is the institutional setting that I'm claiming is um, going to be driving the results? So I'm going to spend a bunch of time on each of them. Um, and, and really, I'm going to just try to, to convey each of these two results in turn for the rest of the presentation by getting into the institutional setting and by clarifying how the institutional setting uh, generates the results. I will be doing this at a high level, but at the end, I will give you a reference to the actual paper that shows this all formally. And, and you know, I'm happy to, to discuss the, the technical details and so on to the level that uh, it's to the level that the, the audience is interested in that. But let's get into the to, to the, the first of the main of, the, of, the, of these two results, which is scaling undermines uh, adoption for proof of work blockchains. So, of course, the first thing to understand is well, what is a proof of work blockchain? Um, and, and to take even a step back from there, um, we can ask what does the consensus protocol really do? Well, let me offer kind of a, a high level context here. So just 
think of a blockchain, for example, in the simplest case as a payment system where you're adding transactions um, in chunks. Um, and, and what happens is the important question to ask is, well, who decides what transactions can go on the blockchain next? Because these blockchains, at least the ones we're describing, are decentralized in the sense that there is no sort of central entity like Visa, for example, that can just choose what is legitimate and what is not. So in the absence of some, enti some central entity like that, you need to have some way of deciding, well, who does decide what goes next on this blockchain? And so proof of works answer to this is that, well, let's have a contest. Let's have a computational contest and whoever wins that contest, that entity gets to decide um, which transactions will be added to the blockchain next. Um, and that, that's really the core of what proof of work is, is that instead of having Visa add, decide who, who gets to put the next set of transactions up there, it's decided by this, by this contest. Now, it's important to understand the contest in a little bit more depth, which is people sometimes say that it's a complicated contest. That's actually not true, and it's, it's importantly not true. Um, the contest is trivial, at least in the intellectual sense. Um, in the sense that the optimal strategy is not something clever, the optimal strategy is actually brute force. Um, and if you want to understand this a bit more deeply, let me offer an analogy, um, uh, a physical analogy of, of what actually is happening in digital space in this computational contest for proof of work. So just imagine, for example, everybody in this room, this virtual room, um, had, a, had a coin, uh, uh, you know, a, a two-sided coin, of course, but uh, there's a very, very small probability that anybody's coin comes up heads and everybody's coin has the same probability of coming up heads. Um, the, the proof of work setting is basically like saying the first person who can flip the coin heads gets to decide what the next set of transactions are. Now, if you think about that for long enough, you realize, well, so if I really want to win this, how should I how should I strategize? How should I win this? Well, just flip the coin as fast as possible, right? Because there's some very small chance it comes up heads. But if you can flip it a lot, then eventually you should be able to get heads. And if you, you're flipping it faster than everybody else, you'll probably be more likely to get heads sooner than everybody else, right? So that turns out to be exactly, by the way, what's going on in the world of these proof of work blockchains like Bitcoin. So for example, if you're wondering why Bitcoin expends so much energy, it's because it's not physically people flipping coins, of course. It's computational hardware that is specialized to do this in a digital context and do it as fast as possible. And so when you ramp up the computational hardware um, in order to try to get the coin to land heads as soon as possible, you basically create this computational arms race, which turns out to actually expend a lot of energy, right? Um, so, so given that context, what it really means is that the ability to control the blockchain, the ability to be the one uh, to decide who, what the next set of transactions are that get on the blockchain, that depends upon your computational power. This goes back to the point that the optimal strategy is brute force. The more computational power you have, the more likely it is that you are going to win it. So the ability to sort of take control of the blockchain to decide um, what gets added next depends on your level of computational power relative to everybody else's computational power. Now, why is that relevant um, to, to our findings? Well, what's important to understand is then when computation is high, so for example, when Bitcoin is burning a lot of energy or when, um, when Ethereum is burning a lot, it's actually harder for uh, a malicious actor that computer scientists usually refer to as an attacker. So I'm gonna use that language here. It's hard for an attacker, a bad actor to gain control and disrupt the activities on the blockchain. And, and to be clear here, I don't mean anything imaginative by disruption. Um, I mean something actually very simple that is very problematic and easy to execute, assuming you can take control, which is, for example, denying all transaction activity. So imagine the person who does get the coin to land heads decides that that, per that person decides, you know, I'm not actually going to take any transactions in this round. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to decide that nothing goes on the blockchain right now. Now, for example, if you have a bunch of Bitcoin that you want to sell or a bunch of Ether that you want to sell, and the person who controls the ledger is not willing to take any transactions, that means that you're basically frozen out. And the same is true, by the way, in a DeFi context, which is if you want to engage with a particular smart contract and the entity that has taken control of the blockchain decides, well, you know, I don't want to put anything on here right now. That's a problem for you. You're not actually able to interact with it, right? Um, and so the key point here is that 
this computational power ends up being something that is related to then the likelihood of disruption, precisely because um, when the computational power is very low, it's actually easy to disrupt the blockchain for any bad actor, for any so-called attacker. And how does this relate to scaling was, well, as, as we'll see, um, as I'll explain subsequently, scaling turns out to reduce the equilibrium level of computation. So computation is an equilibrium object um, it, because it's expensive. And so there's an economic aspect there. People don't just spend the computation out of the goodness of their hearts. Um, but as, 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 I'll, as I'll clarify as we go, um, when you scale a proof of work blockchain, the, in, the endogenous equilibrium computational power is gonna come down. And that's gonna make it easier for a bad actor to disrupt um, activity on the blockchain. Um, and that's gonna be a problem for users because users don't want to have their activities disrupted, of course, right? Um, but, but let's dig in a little bit more here, right? So um, these, first of all, some language, let me get it out of the way, which is that those, the people who compete in this computational contest are known as miners. Um, all they're doing is the miners are not, you know, particularly uh, complicated entities in the sense that they're really just doing this digital coin flipping that I described with specialized uh, computational hardware. But importantly enough, this is not a, a purely technical thing. Miners are not altruistic. Mining is a business. Uh, there is economics at play here, and it needs to be, I think, incorporated in any serious analysis of what's going on. So that's precisely what we do. We acknowledge that mining is a business and it's not altruistic. Um, and, and what does that mean? Well, um, well, sort of going to the, the core of the thinking behind these sorts of blockchains, in the same way that you don't want to delegate the visa that they get to decide what, what gets added to this blockchain, um, you also don't want to uh, prescribe a subset of entities that could, um, that could win this coin flipping contest. So uh, these proof of work blockchains are explicitly set up so that anybody can participate in mining. Anybody can, even on your laptops or computers right now, as you're listening to me, you could go and, and download the Bitcoin core and participate in the mining process if you so choose. I'm sorry, if you, if you so chose. Um, and, and what this means economically is that the mining sector is competitive and it is characterized by free entry. Uh, because of course, if the um, costs are above the revenues, then that means you're going to get exit because anybody can exit. And if the costs are below the revenues, then you're going to get entrance because anybody can participate in mining. So the key point here on the economic dimension is that this system is set up such that mining is competitive. It's set up such that there is free entry in the mining market. And that what that means is the computation is going to be related to the revenue side. These miners are not doing it out of the goodness of their heart. They're doing it because they're getting paid and they're only going to do it insofar as they are getting paid. So computation is directly related to revenues and kind of coming back to the, the, the result that I'm going to clarify in a, in a few slides here. The role of scaling is that it turns out scaling is going to reduce revenues. And that's how it ends up reducing computation. And computation is going to increase uh, the likelihood of disruption, which is a problem for, for users uh, that they're going to internalize, right? So scaling is coming back in here by reducing the revenues, which is causing this, this, this effect. Um, but let's talk a little bit more about this business of mining and, and to, to clarify where the result is really coming from. Um, so miners uh, receive revenues in two forms in a proof of work blockchain. Um, one form is uh, user fees. Um, that is users that want to interact on the blockchain. So it, the simplest thing to think about here is payments. A user that wants to, for example, send their Bitcoin or send their Ether on Bitcoin or Ethereum respectively, that user can voluntarily choose to pay a fee. Um, and and the, the reasoning for typically paying the fee is that it incentivizes priority service. So you're able to save time in terms of the transaction processing. So this is voluntary, which means it's also going to be endogenous, and it's it's going to be important for for the result that I'm that I'm describing. Um, the second part is what are called block rewards, um, which is probably not the term that we would have been using if economists had come up with Bitcoin, because block rewards are just new units of currency uh, that are paid to miners. So um, as I'll discuss later, it's inflationary. Um, and, and the point is that, yes, it's, it's just, they're minting new units of currency and they happen to be giving it to these miners. Uh, it's called a block reward because each block has, has such a reward. Um, and coming back to the impacts of scaling on this and how, how our results are going to arise, 
Um, scaling is going to endogenously reduce the user fees. Remember those fees are voluntary. Um, so they themselves are sort of an endogenous economic object that are dependent on the, on, on the economic context and scaling changes the economic context. Scaling is going to reduce those fees. Um, and those lower fees then are going to imply lower revenues and lower computational expenditure. And you can imagine the problems that would arise out of that. But so to, to, to clarify, there's an important uh, intermediate result here, right? Which is I just said, scaling reduces fees. So why does scaling reduce fees? Let's, let, let me be a little bit clearer um, and a little bit more explicit about this. Well, again, user fees are, are voluntary. Um, that is, they're endogenous in a more formal sense. Um, and what's important to understand is that the optimal strategy for miners is to sort transactions in descending fee order. Uh, the miners are going to want to get as much revenue as possible. Each miner is going to want to get as much revenue as possible. So if somebody puts a really high value transaction into the pool, if I'm producing the next, if I'm trying to win this, this contest, this coin flipping contest, I'm going to want to take that really high value transaction and put it in my set of transactions that I'm posting to the blockchain, because that means that I get the fees from it, right? So I'm going to, so, so, so the, the order, uh, I should say the, the, the sorting of, of transactions is, is going to be highest fee first, lowest fee last, if you like. Um, and as a consequence, um, high fees imply lower processing times. And it's specifically coming because if I pay a higher fee than somebody else, I get to jump them in line, so to speak. Um, and that means that I don't have to wait for them to be processed. So my process, the processing time is going down because I don't have to wait for them to be processed. But this is where scale becomes really important, right? Because um, the time I save by, uh, for example, paying more than somebody else uh, depends upon the scale of the blockchain. Uh, that is to say that if the blockchain has a higher scale, then I'm actually going to save less time than I would have otherwise saved um, uh, when, I, when I jump somebody in line, right? So taking a very, uh, using large numbers to simplify for a moment, um, imagine that, you know, it took an hour to process each individual transaction. So then if I'm able to pay just a little bit more than one other person, then I would save myself an hour, right? And so if I value my time, that means that maybe it's actually quite valuable for me to just pay a little bit more than the next person. But if the, if, if the blockchain is actually taking, you know, a, a transaction every millisecond, then do I really care to pay so much to just jump one person? I mean, why don't I just wait the one millisecond? I'm only saving a millisecond, right? Um, so when you scale the blockchain, you actually take away the incentive to pay really high fees. And by this is also something that we see empirically um, in, in the data, which is that congestion, um, the more congested the blockchain is, the higher the fees are. But the point is, when you scale the blockchain, you do relieve congestion and that does reduce fees. But the problem is coming from elsewhere, which is, which is the, the specific proof of work setting. So, so to kind of put it all together and clarify this point then, what is the, where is the, where's this result coming from? Well, yeah, you scale the blockchain and kind of as that initial editorial was suggesting, that would, um, that would help us on this dimension of lowering the fees. But the point is that these fees in a proof of work context are revenues for the miners. And that means that when you scale the blockchain, you're reducing the revenues for the miners. Um, but if you reduce the, men, the, 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 the revenues for the miners, then you're reducing the computational expenditure that the miners are themselves uh, expending because they're not, you know, again, do, they're not doing it out of the goodness of their heart. It's a business. You, you reduce their revenues, you're going to reduce their, 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 their expenditures. Um, but then when you reduce their, their expenditures, you make it easy for a bad actor to take control of the blockchain. You make it easy for a bad actor to be relative to be to be flipping a coin relatively fast compared to these uh, miners, and so you make it easy for a bad actor to take over and to disrupt um, the activity on the blockchain, which again is not an, an imaginative thing. We're just talking about somebody basically um, deciding, for example, to not put anything on the blockchain anymore because they want to actually undermine the usability of the blockchain. Um, but an important point here is, um, that users can internalize this, right? Um, users would rationally anticipate that the probability disruption is higher when, um, when the scale is higher. 
Now, they probably wouldn't be staring at the scale of the blockchain, but they would be looking at something like the hash rate, and that would very transparently tell them that the disruption event is actually very likely to occur. And so the consequence of that is that, okay, fine, conditional on not having a disruption event, you might get quick service with, at, at low fees, but the point is you're very likely to have a disruption event. So you probably don't want to use this in the first place. And one sort of uh, simple way to think about this is, again, if you think about it in the simplest context, is the simplest context is something like Bitcoin's context where it's really just payments. If, would you decide to buy Bitcoin today, if you thought there was a significant chance that somebody was going to take over the Bitcoin blockchain and essentially stop any future transaction activity, or at least stop it for a long amount of time, because essentially the, the risk you're exposing yourself to is that your Bitcoin get frozen, right? Because once you buy it, you have it on the blockchain, but if there are no new transactions that can be added for a certain amount of time, again, because this bad actor has taken it over and is disrupting it in what's called a denial of service more formally, um, you can't sell those Bitcoin because there's nothing getting on the blockchain. And the rational economic thing to do in that context would be to not buy the Bitcoin in the first place, right? Which means that adoption is going to actually go down. And it, 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 it's, a, it, it's not, the economics is not materially different if we're talking about decentralized finance versus if we're talking about payments. But the key point is, yes, you, you, you will get lower fees and faster service, but that's not necessarily worth it because you are now exposing yourself to a massive risk and, and users can internalize that and would not actually uh, go through with it if the risk is sufficiently high. Um, so that's the, that's the key result at a very high level on the proof of work side. And again, this applies to Bitcoin, this applies to Ethereum, which are actually the two largest blockchains currently in terms of uh, the market value of their native uh, cryptocurrencies. Um, now, one thing that uh, one, one thing that people sometimes ask um, or when, I, when I present this result is, well, what about block rewards? Uh, because, uh, okay, so fine, maybe scaling does uh, reduce the fees, which would reduce mining revenues, all things equal. Um, but mining revenues also come from these block rewards. So is it possible that we could, you know, increase block rewards to offset the losses from the fee revenues when we scale the blockchain? Um, well, the short answer is no. Uh, it, it involves uh, it, it's some, some intricacy, but let me, let me give you some high level intuition as to what the problem is here as to why block rewards can't just um, solve the problem. Um, this goes back to the point of what block rewards are, which is what I was saying earlier, which is block rewards are just new units of currency that are being handed out to the miners, which crucially means they're not production, they're inflation. And inflation means what you have is not the creation of wealth, but the transfer of wealth. And what you're doing is you are transferring wealth to the miners, but you are transferring it from the users. Um, another way of putting it is that uh, block rewards are an inflation tax um, on users. And users can internalize that inflation tax. And if you have too high of a block reward, then users are not actually going to be interested in using the blockchain because of the fact that you're taxing them too much. And this actually goes very much to the, the heart of the initial thinking, by the way, of Bitcoin. Uh, so, for example, for, for anybody who's read the, the white paper by, you know, penned under the name Satoshi Nakamoto that introduces Bitcoin, um, you all know that uh, Bitcoin's block reward schedule declines in, a, in sort of a piecewise fashion and actually eventually goes to exactly zero. It, it's not that it, you know, approaches zero asymptotically or whatever, it actually goes to exactly zero. And in, in, the, in the paper, uh, Nakamoto explains the thinking, which is, he did understand that this is essentially an inflation tax and he didn't want to have um, an inflation tax on his users, particularly since he, he didn't think very well of you know, centralized governments inflating away their currencies. So he didn't wanna be doing the same thing, at least not in perpetuity. So he designed the schedule to actually decline and then eventually go to exactly zero. Um, and, and so for the same reason that Bitcoin eventually has no block rewards, Block rewards don't actually, I mean, they can't actually solve this problem for that exact reason, which is uh, it's an inflation tax and it itself would drive users out of the system if you make the tax too high. Um, but 
so, so essentially Nakamoto got half of the story right, which is Nakamoto understood that um, block rewards are a problem in the sense that they impose this inflation tax, but he then says that, well, okay, so fees will take care of the revenue problem, and he doesn't do any analysis to think about fees, but that's essentially what we did here. And, and, the, pro pro and the point is that fees, of course, have their own problem associated with them, uh, which is that um, they, you know, the, the congestion is not actually desirable for users, um, and that can also serve as a deterrent for, from using the blockchain. So in some sense, this is kind of a pessimistic picture to paint, um, that block rewards don't solve it, and, 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 and the driving down of the fees is actually a problem due to the, due to the likelihood of disruption. Um, but, but this isn't really a pessimistic uh, position that I'm taking here. Um, uh, and precisely, uh, and that's, that's the case precisely for the reason that proof of work isn't the only game in town, so to speak. And in fact, as I, as I alluded to earlier, um, uh, recent blockchains that have been launched, uh, almost none of them use proof of work. Um, there are sort of forks of the Bitcoin blockchain that inherit it, but, but the, the major blockchains that have been launched more recently largely use something called proof of stake. Some of them use just newly invented protocols separately from that, but, but proof of work is a little bit sort of out of phase. Um, and, and, uh, and I suppose our findings are in line with that in the sense that uh, the picture is much more optimistic when it comes to this, this uh, alternative protocol that's the most prominent one amongst the alternatives, which is proof of stake. So what is though a proof of stake blockchain, right? Um, let's, in the same way that I was trying to clarify the institutional context in proof of work, what is the institutional context in proof of stake? Well, proof of work had this computational context. What proof of stake is going to do is it's going to throw away the computational context and it's going to say, instead of having a computational contest, let's have a lottery and let's hold the lottery over the cryptocurrency units. So, for example, um, in the context of Ethereum, what you would say is, well, we have all these Ether, which is the native cryptocurrency of Ethereum. Why don't we just run a lottery over uh, the, the outstanding units, let's say, of Ether, um, which again is the native currency on Ethereum. And so somebody is going to win the lottery, or rather some unit of currency is going to win, win each lottery. And, and what happens to the winner of the lottery? Well, whoever owns the unit of currency that won the lottery is going to earn the authority to update the blockchain. And what does it mean to have the authority to update the blockchain? Well, the lottery winner um, gets to determine uh, which transactions are added to the blockchain next. So again, remember the, the, the central question with these protocols really is given that we don't want Visa or some other centralized entity just deciding what's going to happen next, we need to have some way of um, kind of we need to have some way of picking who actually will decide what goes next on the uh, on the blockchain, uh, which amounts to uh, selecting somebody who decides which transactions or more generally which activity is going to be um, uh, emanating on the blockchain um, uh, next. So the implication of this, though, is that the ability to control in a proof of stake setting does not depend upon computational power, right? That doesn't even make sense because there is no computational contest. Um, but it doesn't mean that the ability to control doesn't depend on anything. What it means is it depends upon the share of the cryptocurrency that you hold. So one way to think about that is if you want to win a lottery in which there's only one winner, you have to have a large proportion of uh, of the, of, of the outstanding lottery tickets. Or rather, I should say, if you want a high probability to win uh, a lottery, um, you, you need to actually hold a, a large fraction of the lottery tickets. But this is a lottery over the cryptocurrencies, so you need to have a large share of the cryptocurrencies. Um, but then the consequence of that is that the attacker's ability to control depends again, not on computation, but rather on the total market value of the cryptocurrency. Because, of course, you're not born, you know, endowed with units of Ether. Um, so that means you have to actually go out and buy them if you, if you want to execute some sort of uh, exercise where you sort of take control of the blockchain and, for example, deny service, right? Um, and if the market value of the cryptocurrency is very high, then that's going to be really expensive to give yourself any serious chance of taking things over. Uh, whereas if the market value is very low, that's a, that's a pretty trivial exercise then for you to, uh, for you to uh, purchase sufficiently many coins to, 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 to take it over. And so 
where does scale show up in this story? What's the significance of scale in this story? Well, scale is going to um, increase the market value endogenously of the cryptocurrency, and that is going to reduce the disruption probability, right? So, so higher scale, it's going to put upward pressure on the market value, and that's going to make it more expensive for an attacker to um, take control, and therefore you'll have a lower disruption probability which is again, the opposite of basically what happens in a proof of work setting. Um, okay, so why would the scale increase the market value um, in, in a proof of stake setting? Well, just as with proof of work, higher scale does alleviate congestion. Um, and so it endogenously lowers fees. And the channel is exactly what I described before, so I won't go back uh, through it. But the important point here is that these lower fees are going to lead to an increase in the demand for the cryptocurrency. Um, that is to say that because the fees aren't that high, more people are going to be interested in uh, engaging with the blockchain, be it for payments or for decentralized finance applications or other decentralized applications more generally, there'll be more demand for that. But of course, prices are a function of supply and demand. And the consequence of more demand then is that a higher market value for the proof of stake uh, cryptocurrency is then going to arise out of that. Um, so so the, the higher scale is going to lower fees, increase demand, and give you a higher market value. But, but then this is going to very sort of directly uh, get us to uh, our result um, on the proof of stake side, which is actually that higher scale is going to help um, not undermine adoption. But one point I do want to make here is that the intuition that I'm going to describe, describe is actually a little bit more than that initial intuition of conventional wisdom that I was describing earlier. So, so let me kind of go through the chain here, and then I want to clarify that point. So as we said, higher scale alleviates congestion, lower fees. Lower fees, higher demand. Higher demand, higher market value, right? Um, but when the market value goes up, as we said, the, the likelihood that a bad actor could take it over is going to go down because it's just it's more expensive to take this thing over, right? Um, now, crucially, and this, this, this is the piece that sort of is different than the conventional wisdom that the conventional wisdom overlooks, which is that there's an amplification here um, in that the fact that the disruption event is less likely by itself is going, to, is going to encourage more users to use the blockchain, right? It's one thing to say that users are going to be more inclined to use the blockchain because they are going to have to pay lower fees and get service faster. Um, but it's another thing to say that on top of that, they're going to be able to uh, have, their, have their activities less likely to be disrupted. And they're going to internalize this also. And so these are essentially two separate things that are, or well, two related things actually that are going to drive adoption. But each of them is going to, if you like, have an effect. And the overall adoption that you would expect in this setting is actually higher because beyond the, 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 the proposition um, having a lower economic cost, it also has, in, in more technical terms, it has more security uh, because the disruption event is less likely to occur. Um, and, and again, so, you know, the key point here is that users would rationally anticipate these probabilities of disruption. They may not be staring at exactly the scale of the blockchain to do it, but it's, it's not hard to, for example, uh, figure out that the higher the market value of the coin is, the, the more likely it is to be secure. And, and you would imagine there'd be more confidence in investing in uh, a cryptocurrency with a high market value because of the security when it's proof of stake than, than uh, a very low market value uh, cryptocurrency in the proof of stake realm. Um, okay, so one thing I wanna point out here is that uh, there is sort of a, a nice analogy uh, for proof of stake in the context of um, traditional uh, finance, um, which is that proof of stake is actually structured quite a bit uh, like an all equity firm. Whereas proof of work, I think from an economic context is just kind of bizarre, um, but, but proof of stake actually isn't. And so to, to understand this, this analogy that I'm, that I'm putting out here, um, think about the holdings, the cryptocurrency holdings of a proof of stake coin uh, or a proof of stake blockchain rather as akin to voting shares uh, in an all equity firm, right? You have more voting shares, you get more say on what's actually going to happen in the same context, the more coins you hold in a proof of stake blockchain, separate from something like a proof of work blockchain, that actually gives you more control in probability at least. Um, and, at, and, and kind of extending that analogy, you can think of a disruption of a proof of stake blockchain as sort of like a takeover of an all equity firm. 
right? So you have this hostile uh, attacker in this proof of stake context that wants to that wants to undermine what's going on. Um, you can think of that in a similar context of a, of a takeover, at least who wants to take the company in a different direction, maybe maybe not quite as destructive as just literally denying service on a proof of stake blockchain. But but loosely, this this analogy I think is is useful. And and where it gets you is that you can start to think about things like what would make an actual takeover an all equity firm uh, unlikely, which of course is something that we understand very well. It's an, it's a, it's a it's a point in traditional finance. Um, and you know the the first order simplest thing to think about is something like well okay so if the market value of the of the firm is actually very high then it's going to be pretty hard to take over. Um, Apple is going to be much harder to take over than some penny stock if you just wanted to set your mind to taking it over. Um, and in that same context, as I was describing earlier, the proof of stake um, blockchain is going to be harder to disrupt um, if, uh, if, if, it's, if its market value is high. Um, but, but that's a little bit superficial when you just think about the market value. The point I want to actually make is sort of the, the, the stem of the fourth line on this slide, which is the market value itself is endogenous. And so, for example, why might Apple have very high market value? Well, part of the reason it's actually very well run, right? They actually produce a lot of useful stuff. So what is the analogy for a firm being well run um, in, in, in the blockchain context? Well, if you think about the simplest case of like a payments blockchain, well, it's pretty obvious. Like what is the value of a, of a payment system if not being able to interact uh, cheaply and quickly, which is to say that you want the blockchain to be scaled, right? Um, so scaling a blockchain is a bit like having the firm being well run, at least at a very high level. And, it, and the concept and, and, and the implication of that is that endogenously you get high market values. And both in the case of say an all equity firm, the high market value serves as a, a deterrent to a takeover, but the high market value in the proof of stake context is also going to serve um, as a, a deterrent to, to a disruption event. Um, and, and, that's what, and, and, and so you, you get the outcome you kind of would like, which is that you would get higher adoption because it's even now secure in, in addition to being um, in addition to being cost effective uh, but this is not true by the way for proof of work which is the, which is an important point because you can you know I've tried to think about analogies for proof of work in a traditional finance context I, I struggle with it myself because it's really a, a sort of setting that an economist would never have come up with you are essentially sort of outsourcing the security of your firm to these mercenaries and it creates um, the sort of issues that that really are at the heart of the first result where very intuitive things that you would think would hold true, like scaling the blockchain would increase adoption, don't necessarily do that. Um, but let me leave that alone uh, for now. And actually, you know, I, I, I'll conclude a little bit early here, leaving plenty of time for questions. Um, but let me, let me just summarize a bit here. Um, so a proof of work blockchain, like Bitcoin, like Ethereum, what's really happening here, maybe in a more, uh, in more in the context of how sometimes computer scientists talk about this, is that scale and security, which are two things that are both desirable, are actually at odds with each other. They compete with each other. So when you scale the blockchain, um, a proof of work blockchain that is, you undermine security. So the intu if you think about the intuition that I was sketching out at the very outset, the, conven the conventional wisdom, what's actually the problem with the conventional wisdom is it sort of holds security as fixed. It, does, it ignores security, in fact, completely, but that's you can think of it as just holding the security of the blockchain fixed and saying, hey, what if I scale it and nothing happens to security? Well, that's, that's of course, great, right? But the, the point is that the setting is such that those two things are linked together and that if you scale the blockchain, you will undermine the security of the blockchain. And the consequence of that is that you just really can't scale it all that much because ultimately, if you make the system too insecure, it's completely useless. I mean, what is the value of a blockchain uh, or any system in which you can get quick service, but you can also basically get, you know, um, uh, your, your, your transactions are also just completely insecure. Um, that there's not any value in that sort of a setting. And so what it really means is that you have to limit the extent to which you scale it so that you don't destroy the security of the system. And what that means, practically speaking, for something like Bitcoin is that scaling Bitcoin beyond a point um, is going to be self-defeating. Now, Bitcoin is set up in such a way um, that, you know, it's, it's hard to make changes, make big changes, at least on Bitcoin, because of the way the community is set up. Ethereum, of course, is much more likely to make big changes. And luckily enough, while it's a proof of work blockchain, so it's still subject to the criticism that I'm describing here, 
it does have a test chain on proof of stake and it does intend at least um, as they keep on saying to transition to proof of stake. And for proof of stake, scale and security actually sort of go together in the sense that scale actually enhances security and it, it works through the essential channel that I was describing, which I think relates again to the all equity firm in the sense that scale is making the thing better and that turns out to make it more secure and it, and it does spur adoption. And so coming back to the, the elephant in the DeFi room point, um, DeFi has a lot of cool stuff. And by the way, more generally, even outside of finance, the idea of decentralized applications, dApps, um, there's a lot of cool stuff that's going on in Ethereum and a lot of cool stuff that, I mean, a lot of additional cool stuff that's probably going to arise in the future. Um, but they do need to, to, to get, the, get the economic cost of interacting with the blockchain down. And that means that they really do need to scale it, but in a way that doesn't, you know, undermine them in a, in a different direction, like through the security dimension for proof of work, uh, which means that proof of stake is a pretty good idea, at least some version of it. And so it's not surprising that Ethereum is thinking about proof of stake. It's also not surprising that all these other uh, blockchain platforms that are launching more recently, Cardano, for example, um, are using proof of stake um, uh, because the, the incentives are better aligned as, as this work does show. Now, uh, I, I, I've referenced the work a number of times, but I didn't actually uh, tell you what the paper is. So, so, so uh, I, for some reason, I thought it might might be more worthwhile if I first maybe uh, uh, present the paper and then tell you what it is, rather than the other way around. You might forget what the paper was. Um, so, so the paper is actually called "Economic Implications of Scaling Blockchains: Why the Consensus Protocol Matters." Um, that is, proof of work versus proof of stake makes a difference. It is joint with uh, Coast John at NYU Stern and uh, Thomas Rivera at uh, McGill University. Uh, there are versions of it online on probably on each of our websites uh, and on SSRN. So uh, please feel free, uh, or actually I encourage everybody to check it out and, and read through it uh, carefully. Um, let me also, if I may, um, briefly offer a resource for anybody who is interested in the sort of stuff that I'm discussing here, which is sort of the economics associated with, uh, with blockchain. So um, uh, I'm part of a, a, a group of faculty across various universities um, that um, run these, uh, these, web, these webinars around blockchain economics. Um, and actually next week, I'll be hosting one of them um, with a computer scientist at Columbia University by the name of Tim Ruffgarden, um, former Goodell Prize winner and uh, you know, a leading computer scientist um, in particularly algorithmic game theory. And he'll be talking about uh, a change to the Ethereum blockchain from a couple of months ago, um, the so-called uh, London hard fork uh, EIP 1559, which changed the transaction fee mechanism of Ethereum, which hopefully it's clear now, that's actually very important to what's going on because you need low fees in order to actually get these blockchains to be uh, widely used. Um, so if anybody's interested in that, um, it's, it's gonna be next Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And for details, you can consult the website cber-forum.org or follow along uh, on, on Twitter. Um, but with that, um, I will conclude a little bit early, uh, giving us plenty of questions, uh, plenty of time for questions. Um, well, all right. Thank you very much, uh, Fahad. Very interesting uh, presentation. And uh, we have uh, quite a few questions already from the audience, and I have a few questions myself. So uh, let me uh, look at the questions that uh, well, Farshid asked. Uh, uh, if the larger sort of uh, stakeholders uh, are going to execute uh, these uh, um basically transaction and get rewarded, uh, sort of what happens to the smaller ones? Are they gonna basically survive uh, sort of the, in the long run uh, or not? So what, what's, what's the economics of it for a smaller uh, uh, stakeholders? So that is a, uh, that is, that is a good question that, that deserves perhaps its own research paper. Um, I, I, I will say that there are conditions under which um, you get stability and wealth share. So I have a paper in management science um, that discusses, that analyzes the stability of um, basically how large these players end up being in the, in the long run. Um, and um, it, it assumes, so under risk neutral assumptions, you are able to have basically that the small guys survive and the big guys survive. I'm not, it's not clear to me that that result would sustain if you, if you relax the risk neutrality, um, but uh, I'd have to, I'd have to I'd have to sort of formally model it to really give a, a good answer to that question. All right, thanks. 
Uh, another question uh, from Madab uh, says, could you please uh, elaborate on how users anticipate probability of disruption using in uh, uh, proof of work? And does it mean that Bitcoin is more risky sort, sort of the, than other uh, cryptocurrencies that don't rely on, uh, on this, such as Ethereum perhaps? Sure, absolutely. So um, the, the, the usual thing that people will use to, 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 to sort of guess whether a blockchain is easy to take over or not in the proof of work context is the hash rate. So for example, it, it, there are ways to, to back out approximately, and when I say hash rate, I just mean the computational power that's being used. So there are ways to back out approximately how much computational power each of these blockchains are being, I mean, are using. Um, I'm sure many people have seen these like pictures of graphs where Bitcoin's level of energy consumption is compared to entire countries. It's, so so, so there, there, there are methodologies for this that are fairly straightforward actually. Um, and, and so essentially if something has a very high amount of energy expenditure, that means that, so for example, if you take seriously those estimates that, you know, Bitcoin might have an energy expenditure on the order of the country of Austria, you essentially have to ask yourself the question, like, well, who is, is there an actor who is motivated enough to expend the amount of energy of the country of Austria and just for the sake of doing damage. And if you think not then probably that's pretty secure and you might be pretty comfortable um, engaging um, on a transaction in Bitcoin, at least as far as the security is concerned. Um, I mean, the truth is given, given how much energy Bitcoin does expend, um, it's, uh, you're probably at the level that, you know, unless the US government wants to take it out or the Chinese government or some, you know, some large sovereign government, then, 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 you, then you're probably relatively safe. It's not like we with our level of resources could do that in this room, for example. Um, but by the same token, then there are uh, blockchains uh, that, in fact, every other blockchain is much less secure. On the, every other proof of work blockchain is much less secure because you can do the same calculation and see how much weaker those blockchains, for example, are uh, in terms of their computational power. Um, and so th this is this has been exploited. Um, for example, uh, people have I think people are now familiar with the idea that sometimes people uh, create like this a fork of Bitcoin where they created a parallel currency, a parallel blockchain. Well, sometimes uh, those blockchains get killed immediately because the point is they don't actually have very many people actually um, mining on it. And, and the, 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 the parent blockchain decides that they don't like that competition. They don't want it to grow. So while, it, while it's sort of very young, um, they basically, uh, they, 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 they do kind of, as I was describing, they, they take it over and they do bad things like just like not accepting any transactions. And then people just abandon it. it. It's a little bit like the, you know, the early infant industry problem, where you need to protect the the, the industry early on, otherwise people can base, otherwise it can fail. Um, so the key thing for proof of work is you want to look at the computational expenditure, which is pretty easy uh, to figure out, or at least to approximate. Um, and as I said, for proof of stake, it's it's uh, the market value. Both of which are, of course, fairly easy to observe. Uh -huh. So uh, maybe in the ballpark, sort of, what is the economics of someone who wants to take over Bitcoin using proof of, um, uh, proof of work versus proof of stake? I mean, if Bitcoin does move, I mean, is it the same amount of capital, for the lack of a better word, needed in either one, or depends on the structure of the blockchain or uh, the way it's set up? In, in other words, one could be far more economical if you were to disrupt than the other one. So um, that, that's another interesting question. And I, uh, without having formally modeled it, I don't want to say something too, uh, too uh, firm, but I will say the following. So um, I know of a computer scientist who sort of looked into this question, at least for Ethereum, because Ethereum is the one that is claiming that they're going to switch to proof of stake. And it seems more likely that they would actually be able to pull it off. Um, and if so, if you imagine basically going from the security that is implied by the hash rate, the computational power that the Ethereum blockchain currently um, has, to the security implied by the market value of the Ether cryptocurrency, it's actually an order of magnitude difference, meaning Ethereum should become much more secure if it, swifts, if it switches to proof of stake and the market value stays exactly where it is right now. Um, now, of course, these are endogenous objects. So if it suddenly flipped the switch, it's not clear that the market value would be exactly where it is right now. And that's why I'm, I, I wanna hesitate a little bit to, to really take a stand on that. Mm -hmm. um, but independently though, if, if you think that is the case, it's, it's sort of interesting to think about, well, why is it 
that you have this this discrepancy. So I actually asked this this computer scientist this question off, off the off the cuff, and what he told me was um, uh, was in, weirdly enough like an economic answer. But of course, he hadn't done any economic analysis. He was like, you know, I think it, it probably has something to do with the deadweight loss of proof of work. Like somehow that because proof of work is you know providing the resources to these external agents and call, and they're doing this essentially useless coin flipping exercise. Um, that there's a loss from that that a proof of stake platform wouldn't have. And so, so if you switch a proof of work to a proof of stake, you should actually sort of save yourself that. And so you should endogenously have more security. Um, and, and I guess he saw Ethereum as, as reflecting that. Um, but, um, but he hadn't done any formal economic analysis on it. And I haven't either. So I'm not going to take too strong of a stand on that one. Another question is about scalability and uh, sort of the frequency domain. Uh, for uh, for proof of work is about ten minutes, right? For blockchain, uh, Bitcoin blockchain. What what is the what's the frequency for proof of stake? Is it going to change? Is it going to be sort of faster in that sense? So so the, the the frequency the is is a tuning parameter actually. You can you can change the the frequency. So for example, Bitcoin does do. Uh, a block every 10 minutes uh, on average. It's actually a, a random process, but on average, it's about every 10 minutes. Ethereum that uses proof of work, by the way, takes 10 to 15 seconds to produce a block. So you can speed that up. Um, and and that's, sort of part of, that's sort of what we were talking about here when we we're talking about scaling the blockchain is like, just imagine you uh, were to, to speed it up. Um, now, the truth is that there are certain limitations that we are abstracting from in this particular uh, paper which is that because it's a, a decentralized network, um, information is not uh, information is not immediately available to, common information is not immediately available to everybody. So for example, let's say you create a block, you, 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 know, you, you win the contest, let's say, you have to tell everybody you won the contest and until you tell everybody you won the contest, um, then, uh, then other people are actually still trying to win the contest. And so, for example, if it takes you five seconds to tell me you won the contest, and in that five seconds, I win the contest, now you and I disagree about who won the contest. And that's called a fork. Um, and so there's a whole issue about then resolving that sort of fork. And actually, this thing about, about us disagreeing is much more likely if the blockchain is running faster. Well, basically, where the intuition is that if the blockchain is running faster, every individual person is, is more likely to get a solution sooner because basically everybody's coin is more likely to land heads than otherwise. That's how you would speed it up, right? And so because everybody's coin is more likely to land heads, that means that in the time it takes you to send information, I might actually solve the puzzle too, and then we'll disagree. And so there's usually a practical constraint that at least computer scientists think of, um, which is on the order of about 10 seconds. Um, as to the block times, which is you don't want to make it faster than that, because if you do, then you're going to have so much disagreement just coming because people aren't actually seeing things at the same time or aren't able to kind of see the same picture. Um, it's too much confusion. Um, it's, it, it's like too many people in the room trying to talk at the same time or something like that. Um, and so, so there is this element to which, which we abstract in this particular uh, paper of you can't speed it up too fast, but proof of work itself does have a range of um, transaction rates from live proof of work blockchains. As I said, Bitcoin is 10 minutes a block. Ethereum is 10 to 15 seconds. Proof of stake blockchains tend to be closer to the 10 to 15 second mark. And there are arguments from computer scientists that loosely speaking, proof of stake does do a better job in terms of the technical issues of speeding up the blockchain. So in terms of what I was just describing about like, are you and I going to disagree about who actually, you know, won in a proof of stake setting? Um, on the technical side, there are some advantages to having proof of stake versus proof of work, but that doesn't mean that you can go to like exactly, you know, arbitrarily small block times. You because again, it's a distributed network, and so you're going to have uh, differences in information that need to be reconciled by sending. Um, by, by sending information across the network. And if you speed up the blockchain too fast, you're going to make it so that they're not able to send it fast enough. Mm -hmm. uh, and another question is, uh, is there sort of a economies of a scale in, in proof of stake? In other words, uh, the smaller uh, uh, blockchains, because the market value is so low, are, are easily sort of uh, manipulated or there's a you know, 
uh, some bad actor could take over while the largest ones are, the, are safer. So is there a tendency to just everyone move to one blockchain because that becomes the safest over time? Yes, I think um, empirically this seems to be the case, and I think actually the, the sort of the, the the regular economic theory we have around winner take all and so on in some of these markets, I I don't see why it shouldn't apply. So empirically, uh, the. There, there are lots and lots of blockchains. Of course, it's actually trivial to create a blockchain. So, so we actually don't know how many blockchains there are in the world because, you know, you could create one and not tell anybody. Um, but even if you just look at, you know, listed blockchains, um, there, you know, there are hundreds and there, and the number of cryptocurrencies in the, is in the thousands. Um, so, but, but, but part of the reason I'm highlighting that is because, you know, most of us don't know even the names of all of these blockchains and cryptocurrencies. It's because they're actually very, very small because there is a bit of like this winner take all effect. And as I survey sort of, let's say the, the blockchains that people actually are familiar with, you kind of, I think, see it in the sense that, so Bitcoin is still the biggest blockchain by market value. And you could ask why that is. Well, it is actually quite secure. Um, and, and, and that might be what's kind of helping it stay, stay along I mean, and, and hang in there. Um, and, and you think about sort of the other blockchains that managed to still be relevant despite blockchain, despite Bitcoin being around, they actually have a differentiator in some sense on the product dimension. So, I, so the question was asking about like security, right? But so one thing to think about is that their, their preferences are across, you know, a variety of things. And so being the most secure blockchain might mean that you do stick around, but it might be that, for example, Bitcoin is very limited in what it actually can do. So it cannot do things like decentralized exchanges. It can't do these sort of interesting DeFi applications. And so that gives life to Ethereum. Ethereum may not be as secure as Bitcoin, but so it loses on that dimension, but it's sort of the winner in the smart contract context, right? And then Cardano is kind of the uh, proof of stake meets smart contract context. And so if you go down the list, you can sort of see how they have different value propositions that are progressively less compelling because they're progressively less differentiated. And so, you know, the, there's a very long tail of very small blockchains, but a few of them uh, do seem to have, there, there's this winner take all aspect. It's just, it's not one dimension, just security. It's there are other things that are, that are also, um, uh, things that people care about. And so you end up with kind of a few of them hanging around as I would say relevant. Hmm. I read that there's some anecdotal evidence that the miners on Ethereum blockchain and maybe other uh, somehow sort of front runs some financial transactions, some smart contracts by just delaying, basically adding them or executing them uh, in milliseconds or, or even less than that, I guess. Uh, would that be a problem in proof of stake? Because uh, uh, maybe, maybe there's more room for this front running of certain financial transactions. So what, and, and also what's just your view on this idea that there is some front running going on uh, on the, some of these smart contracts? So I, I, I think there, there is front running going on um, uh, to the best of my understanding. So we, uh, at that, in that webinar series I was describing, our last event was actually on uh, decentralized finance, and one of the speakers was talking about front running, um, and 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 provided some evidence that it is actually going on. I I, I don't see why, given the incentives uh, in, uh, involved, that it wouldn't happen. Um, so I have no reason to to doubt that it is happening, and and it looks like there is fair evidence that it is happening. Um, but um, I'm I'm not sure. So I'm not exactly sure how um, the change of protocol would affect. The incentives, I, I don't see why it would, you know, completely resolve the problem. Um, but actually, you know, I think one of the one of the important points is, and computer scientists are pretty good about this, is that they tend to think a lot about what bad actors could do. Like as economists, we constantly think about preference structures, and we really want it to, you know, we want the sort of the action to be well motivated in some sense that there actually is an incentive. Uh, for, for the for the agent to behave in a particular way, computer scientists frequently look at things in a different way, which is like, you know, forget about why somebody may want to sort of rain on everybody's parade. Let's just suppose somebody wants to rain on somebody's parade, and how could they pull it off, and how could they do bad things? Um, and so they end up, I think, thinking about you know a variety of potential actions that are important for the robustness of these blockchains that we don't always think about. Um, and, and we don't really have enough work, frankly, on, on proof of stake and thinking about how these sorts of things can happen. So I, I don't want to try to guess uh, 
what sorts of bad things could happen and how, how it would differ from a proof of work setting. But I do think this is actually a really important thing for people to think about, particularly as proof of stake becomes more prominent and particularly if Ethereum switches. It's worth noting that part of the change in the fee structure uh, that I was describing that Ethereum did two months ago is actually very counterintuitive to economists, but is exactly for kind of a similar reason here, which is they, they basically created a reservation fee uh, on Ethereum now, and they but they burn the fee. They don't actually give it to the miners. So the first order reaction might be something like, well, hey, aren't you like taking away all this revenue from the miners and isn't that going to make it insecure? But the reason they burn the fee is basically because if they have the fee in there, then uh, they create incentives basically for the miners to misbehave because the fee itself is determined by a bunch of other things um, and the miners can affect that. And so they burn the fee. Um, so there are lots of interesting questions in those dimensions, both on proof of work and proof of stake. And, and you know, I, uh, I, I would very much hope if, uh, in, I would very much hope that, uh, that some of our uh, colleagues in economics and some of our PhD students and so on would take up the mantle and you know, look into some of these things uh, uh, because they're very interesting and actually kind of important, particularly as we as we move away from a proof of work uh, blockchain universe. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, fascinating talk. Uh, I love this area, of course. So uh, I'm, I'm sure we're going to be hearing from you, and I look forward to reading that paper that you uh, made the reference to. It. Again, thank you. Thank you, you so for much. having me. Sure, sure, and have a great day. Thank you. So we're going to take a short break. Uh, Cam Harvey is actually presenting something in Germany. So after that is done, he's going to join us and it's going to be around 12 o'clock. So we're going to take about uh, less than uh, half an hour break and we'll come back. So I'll see you soon. Bye.